The first thing I'd like to do, though, is get everyone to introduce themselves. I'll, I'll go last, because I sort of introduced myself already, so. Very good. Um, my name's Harold, I'm from Gamma Telecom, primarily a Manchester-based company, but we do have offices all over the UK, um, including outside the UK in Budapest as well. Um, and that's it, I'm an IP design engineer. Great, I'm Matt from Benchmark Recruit. We're based here in Sheffield. Uh, I specialize in tech recruitment, um, so I have a really vested interest, but you can look at me as a, uh, an interested outsider in everything that's going on. Um, I'm Hannah. I have just finished a placement year in industry with Bitemark, and I'm going back to finish my final year at uni. Hello, I'm Thomas Mangin. I'm director at Exanetworks. We're an ISP. We specialize in education, saying to schools, and we also have an Exa Foundation, which is a a non-profit part of our activity to teach teachers. And we've already been introduced to Colin. Um, myself, I'm Marek, my, my day job, I'm a bit of a black sheep in the industry because I'm a freelance network engineer. And that sort of leads me into my first question to the panel, which is, um, as, as a freelancer, I'm, I'm finding my time is, well, a lot of people are trying to pull on it. Um, I'm, I'm finding too much work, which is, a nice problem to have for me, but it makes me feel, certainly that last slide um, from Colin, is a skills shortage coming or is it actually already here? And I, I'd like to first ask Thomas, do you think we already have a skills shortage or both? It, it's here and it's not going to go any way. When you see, for example, the IT industry 20 or 30 years ago, you could find people who could say, I know everything. I know hardware, I know OS, I know software, I can do everything. Nowadays, you found that new jobs are being created in the industry every few months. DevOps didn't exist a few years ago, NetOps neither. Those are specialization, but often they are cross-technical specialization. You need to know networking and something else. Like in the old days, to be programmer, you need to know finance and computing. Um, finding people which are often filling those, those gaps, which are more and more important for businesses because things become more, more complex. Uh, become hard and finding people who know those skills become harder and uh, I think when we look as well what attract new people nowadays there is quite a fancy things everyone when they when they are young you say you want to do computer what do you want to do I want to be a game programmer because that's fun and real, you realize very quickly that it's not fun but that's what you want when you start and people coming to infrastructure it was fancy when I was a young it was a new thing the internet it was great it was the cutting edge of technology Nowadays, it's virtual machine, it's, it's more at the top of the stack. And we found that effectively, we are now uh, not fancy anymore. So, almost the industry is not, not sexy and cool. We're well, not sexy, no. No, okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> maybe not. I'm, I'm gonna pass over to, uh, to, to Gamma and ask the same sort of question. Are, are you finding the skill shortage is already here? How, how, what are the challenges you're having with recruitment? Well, from my own, personal perspective, again, keep in mind that I'm not directly involved with uh, recruitment. All I can say is my own personal view based on the experience that I had uh, at Gamma and the different uh, providers that I've worked with. Uh, I do think that uh, there is a, a shortage, uh, without a doubt, as you see the industry is constantly shifting. He did mention uh, around SDN. Uh, and things like that. And you can see the, the skills where as before you just needed to be a well-rounded uh, IP engineer is sort of diverted um, to encompass much more than just, you know, basic IP routing or, or switching uh, for, for the mere fact. So you do expect to an extent to have uh, an understanding on different areas, although you might not be an expert on like software development and things like that. As, as you see on your day-to-day -day jobs, you interact with different people, with different developers, uh, uh, the people who are actually building those systems. So for each, I have at least an understanding, a foundation understanding on, on do, these are the disciplines. I do find them to be critical. So a short answer, yes, there is a skill shortage, but I think that will all be, always be the case uh, within uh, our industry. But at the same time as well, good engineers, uh, you know, well-rounded, experienced engineers, uh, are not having any problems finding job, I, I would say, you know, and <laughs> at least I don't know any really good engineer <laughs> that is currently unemployed, you know. So uh, th that's my, my personal take on it. Well, I think a lot's been said about recruitment. Can we hear from a recruiter? What, 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 are you, what, what do you feel? Uh, is there a skills shortage? Are, are you literally having 
employers bite your arm off for candidates? Um, it's a really interesting dynamic. Um, so the data tells us that there is a skill shortage at the moment. Um, so I can only speak for here in Sheffield, but 60% of employers um, say that they have vacancies that are hard to fill. Uh, and when you know the business impact of not having the right people in those jobs or not having the right skills in your business, then you can see that there's a, a real issue there. So there is a skill shortage according to the data. Um, and then why that comes about, there's a mismatch between what employers want and what candidates or what um, workers say they have or say they can do. Now, from a recruitment perspective, obviously that throws up some really interesting problems that we try and help solve. Um, I know we are seen as a necessary evil, but really I, I guess the, the, the mix is in bringing together the right skills and um, the demand for those skills. So is it because people are drawn to the more sexy cool tech that there is this mismatch, or is it that we as employers are not, are not communicating our, our needs very well? Where do you feel it might be? Yeah, there's, um, so there's a, a couple of different points in there, but um, the, the idea of the industry not being sexy or, or cool enough, um, tell you what, if you've got IT skills, if you are in any way connected um, or plugged into the technical industry, it's sexy enough in, in your eyes. So I, I don't think there is necessarily an image problem within the sector, um, because actually what, what one person finds attractive or, or sexy in terms of jobs and skills um, it is, it's almost irrelevant what, that, what other people think. So I don't necessarily think there's an image problem, but what I do think is that tech, um, networking, th these areas are so fast-paced um, that actually what is current, what is relevant right now, at this moment in time, will change by you know, 24 hours from now. So the skills side of it, yes, it's constantly changing. Um, but I think a really interesting point that Colin made in his presentation and I think, Thomas, you alluded to as well, is that if you can problem solve, if you can understand issues and if you can change or flex according to what those issues are and know the route to finding those problems, then you'll adapt really, really well to the perceived skill shortage. Can I just add a point? This is, without a doubt, uh, from my own personal view, one of the, the most important points. You know, the technical skills, you can teach. I mean, at Gamma, we do have um, a graduate's program to where we go to different universities and we bring in the first class to ones, you know, the top students to full, pretty much full time employment, you know, either directly from a bachelor's degree or from a master's degree. And uh, you can see that the foundation skills are there, the technical skills are there, but as you mentioned, uh, it's mainly theoretical. It's a very little to non existent, no, non practical, you know. Most of the practical skills have been within a lab where there is no sort of change control, no downtime or, or real customer impact or anything like that, you know? So when you get advice like, oh, just reboot the route and, <laughs> and things like that, say, hold on, it doesn't quite work like that. Um, so although the technical skills are extremely important, and I do find that given how, how much the industry is changing, uh, and the IT in general, uh, I think that the institutions, they're doing a, a good job in trying to keep the, with the curriculum. And of course, there are professional certifications as well, which tend to be much fast-paced, like things like uh, Cisco, you know, Juniper, you know, they, they're constantly, you know, re, re, revising the, the, their exam blueprint and, and things like that. But I do find that the, the soft skills, mm -hmm. like the critical thinking, uh, you know, report writing, they're great. You know, they come there, they can write a report all day for you. <laughs> so they tend to do a really good job uh, on that. But uh, having the ability to actually understand the problem, yeah. interact with the different people, like you're working on a particular project, you're an IP design engineer, but you're working with a software engineer, or you're working from someone from sales that wants you to understand, you know, how, you know, changing that IP address, or how much can I charge that particular customer <laughs> for that particular change, you know, what's the actual downtime, what's the impact. So these are not the kind of things that you will learn with any technical uh, uh, curriculum, you know, be vendor or academic, but that's something that has to come from the individual, mm. you know, the critical thinking, being able to, to, to step back and say, okay, what is actually being asked here, you know, and how can I actually adapt uh, yeah. to, to that? I think that's very important. Yeah, you, you make some interesting points there, and actually, I, this is where I want to ask Hannah a question, because when, when I studied computer science, it was purely academic, three years, out you go, no practical sort of experience beyond an awful lot of maths. Um, 
On the other side, you've done a degree where you've actually spent a year in Bitemark, actually doing some real world stuff. Tell us a little bit about that. Has that, do you feel, made you a bit more ready for the real world in a year's time? Yeah, it's been absolutely invaluable. Um, I mean, uni teaches you lots of skills. Um, I do computer science, so it's quite a broad look at tech. Um, but doing a year in industry has really been hands-on. It means I've been getting experience with um, a huge network and uh, lots of different people from lots of different disciplines. It's been good for my soft skills. It's been good for technical skills. It, um, I've just been able to really test my own knowledge in a supported environment. Um, mm. It's been amazing. Yeah, really valuable. I think Colin Scott. Your question. Mm? I just wanted to ask you a question because it's very valid. That I mean, I'm the same. I did a computer science degree when I was at university. I learned more in my th first three months in a job than I did in the theoretical at university. Do you think if you would have had that time in industry earlier in your career, would it have been as inv invaluable to you? Um, <laughs> so if. Before I went to uni, I had barely any knowledge of computer science. It just wasn't available at school. Um, so I think I needed the first two years to sort of get a basis. Um, but seeing the industry and um, being involved in it has um, been really important. And if we can give that to people, um, if they get a bit of education and then a bit more understanding earlier, um, before they sign up to a whole degree in three years and a whole career after that, it would be incredible because I know some people will get to industry and hate it. Um. I mean, the way I got started in industry was as a, a sort of hobby. Uh, I, I, I knew I wanted to do computer science because computers were cool on it. I think that's probably true for quite a few people on the panel now. Are things like um, Raspberry Pi, BBC Microbit, is this going to be the, the renaissance of that hobbyist thing that gets people in? Um, General question to everybody here. Yeah, uh, I've, I am, I've t taught with Raspberry Pis and I've taught with Microbits and Arduinos and all those kind of things. And we have a lot of students come through our doors that are hobbyists and are really keen to get into this and are amazing. The, the things that they create, their imaginations are alight. Whether that translates into a future career, I think remains to be seen because that's still within its infancy in a lot of cases. And I know that there is a huge amount being put into this from the Raspberry Pi Foundation, people like the Exa Foundations are, are really pushing this kind of digital makers and, and the actual, you know, computer science again, I suppose, but they really are pushing it. Um, if you're asking me, is somebody who's going to be a hobbyist as, as a Raspberry Pi coder maker going to get into en engineering and network engineering? I'm not so sure because it's not a vital, essential part of what they do with that device. And I think that's where the issue is. I don't know if anyone's got anything else to add to that. Yeah, I mean, the hardest part for me being on a placement year was the networking, because there is no opportunity to do anything practical. Like, I'd never, like, seen a switch in person until I started working. Dark art. I'd like to say that many people will come for an interview and have a CCN and CCNP, and things are fantastic. Uh, I have no knowledge whatsoever. They, they often are very technical based by, by knowledge. Some people I see on CV come for a job, have a CCNN, CCNP, and you say that every time they have a job, they stay a year and a half, which is the time it took them to get the next certification to get a new employer. And they don't know anything, but they are trying of stacking certification. And the number of, number of time recruitment agency send people, which are, I would say, certification stackers, which in effect you don't want in your business because they are going to take your resources, time in training, time, in time to get them to the job, to, to do the job, and will not stay, is quite a large population of uh, what I would say you see trying to go for, for agencies. Yeah, pass your mic. So uh, on this, whether a hobby can essentially develop it into a, to a career path, I genuinely believe that it can. Uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, from my own personal experience, that's how it uh, essentially started. I uh, started my career as a, as a sys sysadmin, you know, from a Linux, Linux background. Uh, and then 
went to university, uh, did a, a, a bachelor's in, in forensic computing because I wanted to be involved a bit with the security side of things. But within the curriculum, there was networking. Um, and of all the different you know, disciplines and subjects within that, I did find the networking the most interesting. That's the one that I actually decided. Uh, but uh, from that point, it was just a hobby. Again, I had very little directly uh, network engineering or network design experience at that point. Uh, and the options that I had at the time, um, given there was very little virtualization, you know, uh, where you could get all these virtual router switches as you can nowadays to an extent. Um, so I had to actually essentially buy, buy the gear, you know, <laughs> on eBay and build my own lab. I still got like 15, 20 <laughs> um, routers uh, in the back of my garage that I cannot just part with. Um, but uh, so I generally believe that, that it can. And you can get a lot of the, the hands-on, the practical experience uh, on that. Of course, nothing will equate until will, will be equates to interview ex uh, experience, right? You can go to an interview and you can say, oh yeah, I have lab X, Y, and Z. I have a foundation understand of like BGP or MPLS and, uh, and et cetera. But uh, of course, um, from a recruiter, from a hiring manager, perhaps, perspective, you know, they, they actually want to know, okay, if I was to give you the job, would I actually be able to deliver? You know, would I be, actually be able to maintain a network or will I have to be constantly looking over a show to make sure they don't take out the entire network, so to speak? Which brings to the second point that you, you mentioned around certifications. Um, I do think, personally, again, uh, I do have got quite a few certifications that try to maintain that as active as possible. Again, not because I believe them to be the the answer, you know, you, you, I'm sure there's people in this room here that have no certification that could put me to sleep talking about MPLS and BGP. <laughs> uh, and, but that's not a problem. But the reason why I do follow the certifications, why I try to, to be active or at least, you know, try to renew or take one or two, two of them a year is just one, so I know what's going on in the industry, you know, where the vendors are sort of shaping, uh, you know, uh, uh, the industry, because if you see how they put the certifications together, they essentially go out and speak to, to the different, you know, uh, industry leaders and ask, okay, what sort of skills, pretty much what, what you've been trying to, to accomplish from an academic perspective. So uh, that, that tends to be quite good, but I totally agree that those certifications are not the answer for everything. You know, you can, uh, I've met, I know a lot of people that has a bunch of uh, professional certification from across different vendors. But uh, when I actually come to ask them some foundation questions, you know, <laughs> uh, they, they do lack. And that comes in instantly within like 30 seconds of that conversation, you know what I mean? But uh, well. Yeah, it, this, this is something that has come up actually in, in a lot of conversations I've mm -hmm. had. Are, are vendor certifications the answer? Probably not. But from a recruitment angle, they probably make your life easier mm. in some respects. Yeah, so um, <laughs> this is probably where someone who's not so technical as such as myself, I mean, I do have a slight background and very little credibility in computing, but um, it, it, it brings a, um, an industry standard to the table, doesn't it? So uh, if a, a company or a hiring organization would say, we need someone who is CCNA, that makes it very easy for someone like me to, to use that as the benchmark for if you meet this standard, um, then you are at least what this company are looking for. Because the other approach is to start talking about years of experience. Um, so, you know, does, does someone have five, six, seven, eight years of experience? If so, they're likely to have encountered the sorts of issues that we as an organization encounter day in, day out. They're likely to have the right sort of skill set or the right sort of approach to handling those issues. Now, industry uh, accreditation or qualifications, uh, that's a bit of a shortcut um, from our perspective to, to trying to find the right sets of skills. Um, so it does make it easier when recruiting, but equally I'm sure everyone in the room knows that it's quite easy in some instances to uh, get an accreditation or a qualification and still not know what you're talking about. Um, I know examples of, of people who could have a, a long, 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 long list of certifications on paper or on their CV that um, you put them in front of the right, uh, the right person, they can undo that within seconds. I think one of the challenges also around certifications is nothing gives you those soft skills. There's, there's been a lot of talk and the phrase that's been used, um, I'm going to attribute to Mike Hughes, is around aptitude and attitude. It's not necessarily, do you know how to plumb that router into the right thing? It's, are you, are you going to think critically and figure out 
a solution to a problem that you've been given. How do we address those? Is that university? Oh, oh, everyone wants the microphone now. <laughs> Teaching people how to behave is something which is very hard. It's supposed to be the parent job. <laughs> the problem is the parent doesn't do it, you have a problem. Um, when you employ an employer, you can look at two kinds of employment. One is you want someone trained, someone who knows a job. You probably fit that role, Marek. I want someone today to fill the job because I have a, requir a requirement. Or I want to take some time and, and get someone in and probably train them in-house and get them through the job over, over a period of time. In the first case, what matters is really what they know. Uh, hopefully, you expect them to be nice, to be able to work, co to work, but if they have experience, you expect them to have acquired that over time. Someone young, you expect someone who is malleable, we can work, which have soft skills. And often, those are the things you will know within five minutes. I'm sure if you already employ someone, you see someone, they are waiting in the waiting area, they stand up from the sofa, you shake their hand, and you say, no chance, you have no job here. You have not even spoken hello to them. You know that something is wrong. They were crossing their legs or they had the leg up. They were on the sofa, the arm behind, waiting. An attitude which shows a lack of respect or a lack of understanding of the situation. Nothing to do with skills. The person may be very good. Hopefully, if the person is good, the discussion after that will say, you will say, okay, perhaps he was a bit stressed or you will, find, you will correct your point of view. But often, a lot of part of the impression is done very quickly. And those are things which are soft skills we cannot teach. Uh, even, I will say, in the UK environment, you can even speak about it because if you bring it up, you are opening yourself to HR concerns. So it's even worse. So uh, it's something funny. But I believe that when you look at the employment, the two cases, someone you want trained, often working agencies, uh, you don't tend to come to you because I want, I want a student. You will go to university, to forum, to place where students are going, and you try to interest them in your business, show them why you're a great place and why they shouldn't go to Microsoft, why, why your small business is the right place for their career. Or you want someone from an agency and you expect some CVs of people which have been filtered, and I realize it must be very hard for you to filter it because you are not a technician. Uh, the number of people who come to a job and try to blag it or lie in, during interviews about their skills is very funny because we, when you discover that, you have 10 minutes more to just have fun with them but they don't know, so you're you waiting for them, so why not have fun? No. Um, I completely agree with everything you're saying there. Um, what I try and do with, in my curriculum post is I try and bring industry people in to start that process early. Um, I'll give you an example. I have a student, I'm not going to say his name because he probably will watch this at some point um, just so he can green screen it and do other things to me. Um, but before he came to us, he had to do a presentation to his teacher and his parents said they found him crying in, in, in the bathroom. And what we did is we said, right, you are now a project manager, you're in charge of three other people and you have to deliver the presentation to one of our employer links. And they had to talk about object orientation in this case and for OLP. And um, he was really found it really hard, but the feedback that he got from our employer was fantastic, how well read he was, how well spoken he was, how much he prepared, and that's what gave him the confidence boost in order to think, actually, this is something I can do, and I can be a professional, and I can act in this way. And we've had other students where, again, not mentioning any of names, they're a pain in the backside, and uh, do very little of what you ask them to do, but as soon as you introduce them, saying, you're not doing it for me, you're doing it for that person over there who works at a tech company, all right, and they start to think, right, okay, well, what do I need to do then? And when they get the feedback from the employer, and they can be brutal, um, and encourage them to be brutal, is, you know, they will say, you did this well, but this wasn't good. Or you came in, clearly you weren't prepared, and they, they all find that really valuable. And I think, again, it just comes about the more we can do with that, the earlier we can do with it the more we're going to get the people sat in front of you that are not leaning back on the chairs and things like that. We must be realistic. When you get someone who is 16, 17, I think the earliest some plus one was 16, uh, they are not ready. You, we all have a, 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 a development path, and someone 16 will not be put in charge because simply they will collapse under the stress, and it takes time to build people confidence and build their skills. And with years, when people grow, they tend to know their jobs, they tend to feel secure in their jobs, they know what they do, and then it's easier to develop them. The problem is when you start and you have a student, uh, often it's a blank page, and they don't know themselves what they can and cannot do. Yeah. No, and again, I agree with you there completely. And, and what we're doing here is we're talking about the foundation steps out of the building blocks in order for them to become confident and able to do that job. 
like you. Because <laughs> clearly you are confident in speaking, you have now a technical knowledge and you have that industry experience and that's what we need more people to have in future. One more thing about the sort of industry experience thing. Um, it's, it's a question around, uh, of, of all the, the other students on your course that have had placements elsewhere, how many people were thinking, yeah, networking, that sounds cool and sexy, I want to go do that. Are they, are, uh, were, the, were more people going VR company, cybersecurity, uh, DevOps, cloud, this all sounds cool. What is the feeling of students? Where do they want to go for a placement? Um, well, my uni, I would say less than 10% 10 10 of my course actually did a placement year. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, I know it's a lot better in some unis, but I've never heard of more than 50%. Um, and yeah, people definitely want to do the cybersecurity is something that's a lot of people want to go into. I think it's big money and it sounds cool. Um. <laughs> mm. One thing I was surprised in the UK is I found that when you do a BSc, not only you pay university fee, but you work for nearly nothing. So I found it's very, very hard in university to ask for your fee when the person is not there and when they are going to work for someone else. I found that a bit weird. However, I must say that when I was a student a long time ago um, in France, there was no such placement. And placement make a massive difference because mm -hmm. when you've done a placement and you want to go for <coughs> a job, at least you can relate to your employer. You know what they want, you know what it is, you understand how an office works, how to relate to coworkers. Mm -hmm. If you've only done school work and you were sat at a table listening to people giving, I would say, great talks, you don't get that experience. Uh, and I think it's very important. We so it's just a pity that I think it costs students so much to do it. We've got a couple of minutes left. I was going to just say, we've talked a lot about academic and placements. What about apprenticeships and similar? Is there anything you want to say? Um, I don't think there's much that I haven't already mentioned, you know. Uh, at Gamma, I mean, from my own experience, we do take in uh, graduates. Uh, we do have uh, contact with uh, different universities, and we do bring them in. I mean, right now, we just had a um, quite a large wave of graduates coming in. Uh, and I can see, from a foundational perspective, you know, they're top of, top of, the, of, of the class. Uh, but what I can definitely tell what counts more towards their success is without a doubt their, their soft skills, you know, their ability to adapt. Because we do know that uh, although they're the top of the class, chances are they have, they have had very little or no uh, um, industry exposure uh, or experience uh, whatsoever. So for them to be able to, to come along, understand what's being required of them and, and to adapt, I think is the most uh, it's the most important because the technical side of things we can teach them you know uh, and, and even if they come along and they say oh I have one year experience I've done a lot of BGP yeah you might know a lot about uh, BGP as an example but do you know how we actually use BGP here you know chance I will be very similar but uh, you know everybody have their own particular way where they have their own internal policies and so there is no like uh, uh, right or wrong answers so to speak uh, the technical you know certifications they do help you know, for, for the graduates, they, they, they do come in. But all that means to me, once I see a CV and I see, oh, there is a CCNA, CCNP, it's just a foot in the door. It give me, an, uh, give me an idea of, okay, so he must know about X, Y, and Z. So it's a fair game for me during the interview to, to ask them the, those kind of questions, you know what I mean? If, if you put, oh, I'm an expert on X, Y, and Z, brilliant, I can ask you whatever I want about this and you better be able to answer, right? But yeah. <laughs> it, it sounds like, though, overall, it's, it's not technical skills that seem to be the gap now. It, everyone seems to be saying soft skills, soft skills. It, 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 Last it, words from everyone, come on. Uh, yeah, um, you're right to a certain point, but the problem is, it's getting people to know, understand that that is a career path that's open to them. If you've got, like I showed, a dip in people taking IT, how many people are going to go to the IT at university? How many people are going to go into the IT sector um, after a degree? You find that it's law of diminishing returns. You know, the, the less people go in, the less people will go in in future. And that's what we need to try to reverse. I think we, we only cover one aspect of the problem because if you are Microsoft and you have a graduate program to take students, you can get people in and, and, and get them in and grow them. If you are an SME with 40 person, it's much harder. If you are 10 person, it's even harder. And, and it's a different profile. And in those cases, you, you tend to want people who are already trained. But we found that there is such a demand in our industry that anyone who gets any good at any time and go to UK enough will probably give offer a job by a big business work with an office in 
San Francisco somewhere and be offered to stay in his house and get a brand new job where he's, he's not, not even to move and, and there and you have to compete with that as an SME. So it's, it's an industry, yes, with people, people are moving, but it's hard to get the right people in your business. Um, I just think that it's really, really important to give people uh, their start as well. Um, like everyone obviously wants people to be experienced, but how do you get experienced people without giving, letting them try and having confidence in them and giving them a start? Um, yeah, um, brilliant point from Hannah, exactly what I was just going to say. Um, if I can, I don't know if I can do this. Can I just, okay. after audience participation, if you can raise your hand, if at some point during your career, I don't know for some of us we're looking back a bit further here, but if at some point you have either tried to go for a job or you've been approached about a position and been told we need someone with more experience, if that affects you or someone you know, if you can just raise your hand really quickly. I know it has for me. I suspect there's probably a few more people with that. But so, and then again by a show of hands, who has some influence in hiring for your company? Okay, so a few more. So would the world look different or would the... Um, uh, the, the general ecosystem look different within our industry if we as um, hirers, if we as people of influence were more prepared to give people a start, exactly as Hannah's saying. Um, is there a ripple that can spread out from, from this group of people that says, do you know what, we're not going to look for the perfect person, we're not going to even look for 80% of the perfect person, but we're going to say, I can see enough in you to think that there's potential, that we can put something into you and, and grow the whole ecosystem because of the effort we're prepared to put in. And I, th I think that's a really positive message to finish and open actually for a bit more audience participation because I can see there's some people really bouncing up and down in their seats. Um, James Blessing from JISC. Um, as someone who's been hiring people for, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna just leave the number alone. It's, it's over 20 years. I've always gone on ability before experience because you can't teach ability, but you can teach experience. They can, they can, people will pick that up over time. And it's, I, I will probably upset a lot of people. Um, and I have done over the years during the middle of interviews because I've just gone, no, there's no point, get out, thanks, bye. And you've got to base it on that instinct no matter how much trouble that causes with HR. <laughs> um, and I was also going to throw a little anecdote in. A former colleague of mine who may or may not be watching, um, during an interview with someone who had a certificate and who had six or seven different postings, um, was given a switch to configure. And they cried during that interview because they'd never used a command line before. And just, just in response to that, I presume you would tie in as well as ability, attitude to, to that over experience. Yeah. Uh, right, so uh, David Freeman from Clarinet. I just wanted to mention, um, because I don't think I heard it, but um, there is something that the UK government are bringing in called the apprenticeship levy. Um, and that is that if you have a, a pay bill of more than three million pounds, so it will affect only a perhaps particular percentage of people here, um, you pay into an apprenticeship level and you get that money out um, as you take on apprentices to pay for their training. Um, yeah, the applicability is, is, the bar is set relatively high, um, but it's something to look into if, that, if, if you're going to be asked to pay it from this year. Just to, um, to add to that, so yes, so the, um, the paying into is affected when you hit the three million pound uh, wage bill. Actually, any company can um, take on apprenticeships and something that I don't think many people will be aware of is that if there isn't an apprenticeship that you feel links into what you do, um, you actually have the, the power, the authority to, to team up and design your own training and I'm sure Colin can provide a, a better perspective on that. but. Um, any companies who are in any way looking to invest in future generations and, and want to see what benefits apprentices can offer um, know that actually there's a lot of support there and the barrier to entry to that side of it is actually very, very low. I think there's just one, one time for one last question. Uh, it's a, more of an observation. Even now, for employees that are looking for jobs, 
there's still a big wall of certification. So while everything you're saying about soft skills is correct, as somebody who applies for jobs, there's uh, almost an automated process. And in fact, I've been told it's an automated process. It says, if you don't have these certifications, you won't be seen by a human. So I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's for people who are speaking to uh, the likes of yourself to say, don't ask for those certifications and make it clear that that's the case. Um, another observation is we've had quite a long discussion. Um, I might have missed it, but I didn't hear much talk about the advantage to the employer of doing these things. So it might be worth highlighting that in, in discussions. One thing I noticed is anyone you take out of school and you give a job, give you, I would say, a level of loyalty you will never get. Once someone change job once, they will then see a career elsewhere as well. I think as an employer, getting someone young, an advantage is you can mold someone as you want it. Uh, I have someone which is now in 25, I think, I took it at, at 16. Uh, he is fantastic at his job. He knows our business very well. He knows everything about us. Uh, you, I have an employee which I cannot find elsewhere because you have that kind of, uh, it was molded to what we need. That's what is great when you employ someone. However, when you grow and you have requirement, you, your pace of growth increase, you cannot always wait for someone to be trained and you have to get someone who can do the job now. Um, and if ever someone uh, wants qualification to employ me and don't have them, I'm very pleased I will not apply there. I think we probably have to call it time, unfortunately, but I'd like to thank uh, Geraldo, Matthew, Hannah, Thomas, and Colin very much for their input. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.